Curtis. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Kalman. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we are going to look at a topic today that is less looked at usually when we talk about Tisha B'Av. When we talk about Tisha B'Av, certainly in Israel, we tend to focus on Second Temple times and uh, that Chorban, and uh, largely because so much of it is reflected, unfortunately, in our contemporary reality in terms of how people acted towards each other and uh, and this uh, paradox of a seemingly religious uh, civilization where people really treated each other with such great disrespect, which unfortunately has many parallels today. But if we look back to first temple times, that's, you know, that's the first destruction. And that also has many, uh, many parallels to what's going on today. And it's a very powerful moment. Um, so we're going to take a look at the last 100 years of first Temple Jerusalem. Um, and this is a very, very complicated and very turbulent time, not just in the land of Israel, but in the entire ancient Near East. Empires are rising and falling. Jerusalem expands. We have some good kings, largely bad kings. What's going on? Where is uh, the place of Yehuda of Judea in all of this? The leadership is prophets who the people don't necessarily listen to or connect to. We're going to talk about various ones of them, particularly Jeremiah. Uh, kings, a few good, Hezekiah, uh, Josiah, Chizkiyahu, and Yoshiyahu, but mostly either very bad or very weak. Um, one of the things that's important for us to understand and, and is very helpful for us is that this last hundred years has a lot of archaeology. I'll just mention that I'm not going to look at questions in the chat until the end. I'll leave a few minutes at the end. So put in your questions, feel free, but I'm not answering them while I'm talking. So we have a lot more archaeology than we do with earlier times in biblical history. History. Uh, and this is a great example. What you have in the picture here, um, these are two boule, okay, two seal impressions uh, that were discovered. Actually, it's one seal impression. Um, one is the real thing and one is a, a drawing of it that was discovered in Jerusalem uh, in the city of David. Uh, seal impressions are the offspring of a signet ring, right? Everybody who's important has a tabat, tabat hamelech, right? Think about uh, Paro, think about Achashverosh, but not only kings had these signet rings, any important person, any business person, any um, uh, government minister, and women had them as well. And we find sometimes signet rings, but much more often seal impressions, because one ring can, of course, make hundreds or thousands of impressions. Most of the names we find are biblical-ish names, but not names we're familiar with. But every once in a while, we find a name that actually appears in Tanakh, and, and this is one of them. Hey, we found two together. One says Yuchal ben Shlemya, and one says Gedalia ben Pashchur. And these are names that we have in Tanakh, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, government ministers, not particularly nice guys. Uh, but it, it's instructive because it helps us to understand much more of the reality of the time, because we really do have more archaeology. I know this timeline looks very frightening but we will, we will use it just as a reference point, okay? What we want to understand, when we're saying last 100 years, I use that a little bit um, generously. It's really more 150 years, 130 years. Um, we want to talk about the time period of the Assyrians, right? And the Assyrian conquest in the land of Israel, starting in 734 with the Assyrian king Tiglat Pileser, who comes and attacks in the north and starts to conquer part of the northern kingdom of Israel. This uh, dynamic continues under other kings, and it culminates in 722 when the kingdom of Israel, the, the Shomron, right? The southern part, the northern part has already been conquered and exiled. The southern part is now conquered by Shaman Eser and Sargon. Uh, the Jews are exiled. We're going to talk about this, but this is a huge blow, both physically, of course, and psychologically, uh, not only to the kingdom of Israel, of course, but also to the kingdom of Judah. How could this happen? How could God send out 10 out of the 12 tribes into exile, and they are gone seemingly forever? Okay. Continuing with the story of the Assyrians, we have rebellions all over when there's upheaval in the Assyrian kingdom, culminating with a rebellion of Chizkiyahu, of Hezekiah, king of Judah, who attacks, uh, who stops paying taxes, right? And he prepares for battle. Uh, the Assyrian uh, emperor, the Assyrian king, Sancheriv, marches on Yehuda. He attacks many cities, including Lachish, but he does not succeed in conquering Jerusalem. Jerusalem is saved. A, uh, the people of Jerusalem feel a perhaps false sense of security. 
And that's what leads us into the last chapter of First Temple Times. Hey, just important to understand uh, that the prophet Jeremiah is beginning his career at 627, right, uh, 70 years later. The Assyrians very soon afterwards fall to the Babylonians. The Assyrian Empire dramatically ends, right? This empire that had been so powerful, it comes to a very, very quick conclusion. Um, and that brings us to the events of the last good king of Judah, Josiah, Yoshiahu, who tries to reclaim the kingdom of Israel. He sees this upheaval. The Assyrians are defeated. Maybe he'll be able to get something back. There's a power struggle. There's a power vacuum. Hey, the Egyptians try to step in, but Yoshiahu is defeated and is killed. Uh, and from that point on, everything goes very much downhill. You have this power struggle between Egypt, between the Babylonians. Judah tries to assert itself. All of the kings who come along are evil or weak. Uh, some of them are puppet kings appointed by the Babylonians. Uh, important dates to know, okay, 597. We have the first stage of the exile. We have what's called the Galuta Harash Masger. We're going to talk about this. The, the elite are sent into exile to Babylon. And 11 years later, what we commemorate today, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, conquers Jerusalem, destroys the temple, sends the Jews into exile. It's not the end of the story because we have the coda of the story of Gedaliah and the, the remnants that's left behind. Uh, and we're going to finish up with something a little more hopeful, which is 538 and uh, the edict of Cyrus, King Cyrus of Persia, because again, we've had a shift in empires uh, and the Jews are allowed to return and to rebuild the temple. So that's just to give us the big picture, uh, but don't worry, we're gonna come back to all these things. And again, the kings, the kings are confusing. Their names all sound the same. So it's nice to have them in front of you just to remember them. And if you have, if you printed out the source sheet, you should have this on the source sheet as well. But just to know the names, we have Ahaz ben Yotam, Hey, he is followed by one of the greatest of the kings of Judah, Chizkiyahu, Hezekiah ben Achaz, Hezekiah, whose contemporary is Isaiah. We'll get to the prophets in a minute. Okay, he is responsible for religious reform. He's responsible for, as we said, this, this uh, rebellion against Sancheriv, very important king, followed by a no less important, but certainly much less righteous king, and that's his son, Menashe, who rules for a very long time, right? He rules for a half a century. Uh, and he essentially undoes everything that Hezekiah has done, brings back idolatry in a huge way, right? He's a terrible king. He repents towards the end of his life, but he, his legacy uh, is very long lasting, um, followed by his son Ammon, who has a very short uh, rulership, and then Josiah, Yoshiao, who we're going to see religion has essentially been forgotten in his time, he discovers a Sefer Torah and initiates a second religious reform. Once Yoshiau is killed, we have this string of kings, three of whom are sons of Yoshiau, one of whom is a grandson, okay, uh, none of whom are good, okay, you have Yehoahaz, you have Yehoiakim, you have Yehoiachin, who is the one who the exile happens during his time, and then the final king, Sidkiah, Sidkiah, uh, the son of Josiah. Prophets may be more familiar to us. Okay? Most important one uh, being Isaiah, Yeshayahu. Okay, who rules during the reigns of Ahaz, Chizkiyahu, perhaps Menashe. He is a contemporary of Amos, of Micha, of Hosea, right? The Gemara talks about Arba Nevi'im Shnit Nabubo Taha Perek, four prophets who prophesy at the same time. Sometimes their prophecies overlap, but Isaiah is definitely the the reigning one, right? The, the one who, who has the, the greatest of prophecies, the greatest book, the most influence, but the others are important as well. And Jeremiah, who is the other major prophet, um, who we're going to talk about as the prophet of the time of the destruction, one, probably the most personal uh, of all the prophets, very, very um, heart-rending life story, uh, and one who really touches you, I think, the most. And his contemporaries are unusually a woman, right? Hulda, one of the few female prophetesses, okay? Um, and Yechezkel, Ezekiel, we're going to see we have a split screen. We have two stories going on simultaneously, Jeremiah in the land of Israel, Ezekiel in Babylon. Then we have these other minor prophets, Nachum, Habakkuk, Svanya, scholars disagree about 
if they prophesy during the time of Jeremiah, maybe before, maybe after, we're not gonna deal with them so much, but they are important to know about. Okay, our empires. Empires are very important because they are the engines of the story. They are how God uh, expresses his will in history. So uh, on the left, you have the Assyrian empire. The Assyrian empire is an incredibly powerful empire, which expands to its greatest height in the seventh century, right? You can see it in the in the nice colors here, right? This is the smaller Assyrian empire, 824 BCE, but by the end, almost by the fall of the Assyrian empire in 671, it extends to include Egypt and of course, uh, kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, right? This whole area. They are a very, very militant empire. Um, there are a lot of inner inner rebellions. Um, in 605, there's the battle of Carchemish and the major city of Nineveh is destroyed and Assyria falls. Okay? And the next superpower to come into play in our story is Babylonia, who basically take over um, the area of the earlier Mesopotamian empires. Okay? They're not quite as powerful as Assyria and they definitely do not last as long. Okay? They fall soon after uh, the conquest of Jerusalem. Now, um, the prophets, okay, first Yeshayahu and then Yirmiyahu, uh, but particularly Yeshayahu, uh, speak out a lot against alliances, foreign alliances. They uh, emphasize the idea of trusting in God, which of course is what you need to do, right? God is the supreme power. You need to trust in God. But um, Rabbi Avram Joshua Heschel in his uh, masterwork, The Prophets, he emphasizes another reason why these alliances are so important to stay away from, okay? And he starts, he says like this, the history of Israel began in two acts of rejection, the rejection of Mesopotamia in the days of Abraham and the rejection of Egypt in the days of Moses. In both cases, it was a rejection of political and spiritual sovereignty, right? And he goes on to explain how significant the impact uh, of the gods and the goddesses and the laws of Mesopotamia and Egypt were on the ancient Near East, right? After settling in the land of Canaan, Israel had to face the political and religious challenges of minor city states and local cults. For generations, Israel remained secure from any direct involvement with either Mesopotamia or Egypt. The situation changed rapidly in the 8th century with the emergence of Assyria as an empire intent upon conquering the small states in the Near East. In addition, Egypt, unwilling to permit the power of Assyria to extend to her very borders, began to assert her political and military influence in the same area. Caught in the contest between the two powers, the kings of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel would turn either to Assyria to, for protection or more often to Egypt for protection against Assyria. The hard-won emancipation from Mesopotamia and Egypt that had been brought about in the days of Abraham and Moses faced a dangerous test in the days of Hosea, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. Meaning Heschel is saying it's not only that we need to trust in God and believe that he will carry us through, but by allying ourselves in what seems like a very practical move, ally yourself with somebody strong who's going to help you, you are actually going back to culture that we as, as a Jewish people have been trying to escape for centuries. And that's the greater danger that's going on here. So let's look at the first stage here. And that's the story of the Assyrians. Okay. Uh, just to look at it briefly, just take a look at the map on the left. We know that uh, there's a very, very brief period where all of the tribes are united under King David, under King Solomon. By the time we get to Solomon's son, Rehavam, that's it. It's over. They split and we have the kingdom of Israel, right? The 10 tribes in the north, the kingdom of Judah uh, with the temple, of course, uh, in the south, sometimes amicable, oftentimes not. Um, and in general, the kingdom of Israel's kings are more idolatrous, more wicked than the kingdom of Judah. Not that the kingdom of Judah has so many winners, but the kingdom of Israel is definitely worse. Um, and ultimately, when the Assyrians come, eh, they advance from the north, like we said, Tiglat Pileser comes in 734 and conquers in the far north. One of the places that falls to Tiglat Pileser is the very important um, city of Chatzor, and that's the picture that you see here with uh, a sentry put up in modern times uh, to protect the walls of Chatzor. But they advance uh, and they continue on towards Samaria, towards the Shomron, towards the heart of the kingdom of Israel. Uh, and this is really where this incredibly disastrous event happens 
which is the conquest of Shomron, and not only the conquest of Shomron, but something that has very far-reaching implications, the transfer of populations. Okay, The Assyrians are very warlike people. They are very learned in what to do with places that they conquer. They do not want to destroy and leave these places without any population, because why do that? You could make some money from them. So what they did is, and we know this from other, we have a lot of Assyrian annals of their, uh, of their conquests, they just would transfer the populations. Take one group that you conquer, bring them to the land that you conquered. Take the group from the land that you conquered and move them somewhere else. This way you get a very good workforce that is not connected to the, the land that they are living in and therefore is less likely to rebel. Right? Now we hear about this story uh, in the Book of Kings. Like I said, it's a devastating impact uh, on the people of Israel. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. Hosea, not the prophet, the, the king, Hosea ben Elah. Um, he deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Chala at the river Chavor, at the river Gozan, in the towns of Medea. Okay, he exiles them. And then we have the whole fascinating story, which we will not be going into, of the 10 lost tribes. Um, uh, but in the story in Tanakh, they're gone. They're disappeared. This happened because the Israelites sinned against the Lord their God, who had freed them from the land of Egypt, from the hand of Paro, king of Egypt. Right, and we get the whole Tanakh explanation of why these things happen. Tanakh is not interested in geopolitics. Tanakh is interested in you sinned, and this is how God is punishing you. But then we have the second part of the story. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Ava, Hamat, Barbarim, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. This is why, by the way, the rabbi talk about uh, Samaritans, but they also talk about Kutim because they came from Kuta. Uh, when they first settled there, they did not worship the Lord. So the Lord sends lions against them, which killed some of them. Okay, it's a fascinating story. They don't know how to keep the laws of the land. So lions come and attack them. And they say, well, this is not good. We need to learn how to keep the laws of the land. They said to the king of Assyria, the nations which you deported and resettled do not know the rules of the God of the land. Therefore, he has let lions against them. The king of Assyria gave an order, send there one of the priests who you have deported, let him go and dwell there and let him teach them the practices of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had exiled from Samaria came and settled and taught them how to worship the Lord. However, each nation continued to make its own gods and set them up in the cult places which had been made by the people of Samaria. Okay, so we have this concept in the in rabbinic literature. These guys are called lion converts, Gerei Arayot. Uh, and when we get to the time period of the return, right, Shabbat Zion, they want to join with the Jews who returned from Babylon. The Jews reject them, right? The Samaritans, by the way, have a completely different story. They see themselves as true Jews, but again, a story that we are not going to go into. Um, but this, uh, this terrible disaster uh, of Samaria being destroyed has an effect on Judah as well. Now it has two effects. Eh? Of course, it has a psychological and a spiritual effect. How could this happen? <laughs> to the people of Israel, but it has physical as well, effect as well, because not everybody is exiled. Some people undoubtedly manage to escape. And where do they escape? They escape to the south, to the kingdom of Judea. And where are they going to go? They're going to go to Jerusalem. And we know that at this point, because of archaeology that was uncovered 50 years ago, we know that the city of Jerusalem expands and includes not just the city of David down below, but the western hill, what we call the Jewish quarter today, the city expands. We know that because we find this massive wall called the broad wall in the heart of today's Jewish quarter. It expands because of all these refugees who are coming. Now, because it expands doesn't mean you have a wall. Why do you have a wall? Because King Hezekiah decides that what happened in Samaria cannot happen to him. And so he decides to rebel against the king of Assyria. Now, you would think this is folly, Okay, because he's a tiny little kingdom and the Assyrians are the greatest military power in the world in this area. Uh, but he says, God is on my side. And, and he believes this wholeheartedly and he says this to the people. Um, and he also does a little of his own, you know, his he, he works to prepare things. So this is what he does. He builds this wall. Plus we have the book of Chronicles chapter 32. After these faithful deeds, King Samachar of Assyria inv invaded Judah and encamped against his fortified towns with the aim of taking them over. When Hezekiah saw that Sancharib had come intent on making war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his officers and warriors about stopping the flow of the springs outside the city and they supported him, right? And this is the story of Nikvat 
Chizkiyahu, of the water channel. Okay? They divert the water. Then he rebuilds the breached wall, builds another wall, fortifies the Milo, made a great quantity of arms and shields. He also engages in religious reform so that he'll be prepared spiritually. Okay? Now, the prophet Isaiah at the time is not necessarily so uh, approving of, this, uh, of these preparations. And we have this very fascinating chapter, chapter Isaiah 22, um, where he talks about these preparations that the king does. And you saw the breaches of the city of David, and you gathered together the waters of the lower pool, and you numbered the houses of Jerusalem and broke down the houses to fortify the wall. By the way, when they uncovered the wall, they found a house that had been destroyed to build the wall, exactly what Yeshayahu says. You made a basin between the two walls for the water of the pool, but you look not to him that had done this. Neither had you respect unto him that fashioned it long ago, right? Are you relying on God or are you relying on yourself? And you have this pasuk in the next, the next little piece here in Isaiah chapter 30. Uh, for thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in sitting still and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Now, this is not such an easy prophecy to follow, right? The, the enemy is at the gates. Are, are you really going to just sit and pray? This is not necessarily something that we would do today. But yet, this is Isaiah's message. And indeed, when the enemy is at the gates, Okay, this is just a continuation of the story. This is the tunnel that Chizkiyahu digs. This is the inscription that was found in the tunnel telling us how it was dug, a fascinating story in and of itself, and that they thought to write an inscription like that. They dug from two ends uh, and, and met in the middle. But indeed, what happens is that when, oh, sorry, I put my slides out of order. We're going to skip ahead a drop, and then we'll come back. OK. Um, what happens is that when the Assyrians are at the gates, uh, God does indeed come in and protect them. And it's not the pre preparation with the water and it's not the preparation with the wall, but rather it's God coming in and striking down the Assyrians uh, completely with a plague in one in one night. We'll come back to this. Sorry that I'm jumping around. It's Tisha B'Av, you'll forgive me. Um, a few years earlier, okay, before we have the attack on Jerusalem, Chizkiyahu has rebelled already, but we have an attack uh, the, uh, the Assyrian forces come into the lowlands, right? Into the Shvela, all down over here. And the most spectacular place where we have the Assyrians attack is Lachish, okay? We have a line of fortresses and the Western side of Judah. Okay, beyond that are the Philistines. It's de facto not really Judah, but we have a line of fortresses on the western side of Judah, Lachish, Beit Guvrin, Azekah, right? We're going to see these fortresses again 100 years later with the Babylonians. But the Assyrians come, they hear of this rebellion, and they come first to the outskirts of Judea, and they come to attack the fortresses in the lowland, and they come to Lachish. And in Lachish, okay, the Judeans prepare themselves for battle. Okay, they stockpile weapons, they bring food. In Lachish, we found the largest collection of what are called lamelech handles. You can see an example of it over here. These are jar handles that usually have some kind of a, a decoration, a royal scarab, and they say on them the letters lamed mem, lamed chaf, uh, lamed chaf lamelech, for the king. Okay? This is a way of taking taxes, of taking tribute, so that you have enough food for the soldiers, for the Levites, for the priests. And Hezekiah, we know, does this because we know about it in the Book of Chronicles, but we also see it very clearly in this collection of handles that we find in Lachish, that we find in other places. Okay, so Lachish is preparing for battle. But meanwhile, the Assyrians come. Now, the fascinating thing about Lachish is that we know about the story of Lachish from two sources. Very little in Tanakh, right? Lachish is mentioned kind of by the way in Tanakh that the Assyrians have the headquarters there. But we don't hear very much about the battle. But we do hear about it in two places. One that is 2,700 years old and one from only a few decades ago. Okay? 2,700 years ago, the king of Assyria, Sancheriv, conquers Lachish. He is so pleased with this conquest that he goes and he has his royal artists commission a huge relief for the palace walls at Nineveh. The Assyrian kings loved reliefs. Go to the British Museum and you'll see lots of them that were 
brought back from Nineveh at the, in the middle end of the 19th century because, you know, why should we leave them there for the natives? Let's bring them back to the British Museum. Um, but they would have these reliefs, some of them very pastoral gardens, very beautiful, many of them very much advertising their military conquests, because this is propaganda. You put this on the walls of your palace, and everybody who comes to visit who's thinking, hmm, maybe I won't pay my taxes this year, oh, that's what happens to people who don't pay their taxes, right? And these reliefs are usually very bloody, very detailed. And there's an entire wall in the palace in Lachish, today in the British Museum that shows the siege and the battle and the capture of Lachish in Nineveh. Okay, um, now we have this in the, in the relief. And then in the 1930s, James Starkey, who came and excavated in Lachish, discovered it in real life. So in Lachish, in the relief in Nineveh, we have a siege ramp in the real life. We have this massive siege ramp created out of thousands of tons of stones, building a ramp going all the way up to the top. In the, in the relief, we have the flaming arrows that the Judeans are flinging down or shooting down at the Assyrians. We found the arrows in real life. Okay? In the relief, you have the Assyrian battering ram. This we did not find in real life, okay? unfortunately. But we have the Assyrian battering ram going up the siege ramp. And my favorite detail in this relief pointed out to me by a friend who's a guy in the Israel Museum. Take a look at what's coming out of the battering ram, this thing. This is a fire extinguisher to put out the flaming arrows as they come towards the battering ram. Okay, so all of these pieces are in the relief. All of, almost all of these pieces were found in Lachish and we have evidence of a terrible, terrible battle. We also found in Lachish uh, a lot of, uh, of skeletons. We found uh, catapult stones, all kinds of elements of this battle. Now there are two more uh, panels in the relief, not just the battle, but the panel over here on the left where the um, where the Judeans are being taken, they are ca being taken captive. Some of them are already dead and being brought as tribute to Sancheriv, to the king of Assyria. Another fascinating detail here. Take a look at what some of them are carrying. Okay, these are harps. We're going to come back to this in a hundred years when we talk about the Babylonians taking the Jews into exile and saying to them, sing to us the songs of Zion. We hung our harps in the trees. So this is something that they took with them. And finally, the final panel is here the uh, Syrian uh, soldiers and the, and the generals coming to the king. Uh, and presenting him with the evidence of this uh, of this victory in Lachish. So Lachish is a terrible, terrible disaster. And, and we see the same story was repeated throughout the Shvela. We have evidence of battles uh, and of conquest throughout the Shvela. But when the Assyrians come to Judea, they do not succeed. Okay? And we have the story, which is literally an unbelievable story, meaning it's hard to believe, where uh, the Assyrians attack the city. They don't attack the city. They besiege the city. Uh, and they speak out to the people. And they say to them, you have to give up. And you have to surrender, because there's no way that your god is going to protect you. And you are trusting in your king. But he's not going to do anything for you. And then the king is no, understandably panicked. He goes to Isaiah and Isaiah says, don't worry, the, nothing is going to happen. Not one arrow is going to be shot at Jerusalem. And indeed, the very next day, it says the people of Jerusalem wake up by Yakumu Baboker, Kulam Pigarim Metim, and the entire Assyrian Empire has been wiped out. And there is no more Assyrian Empire. Now, lest you say, oh, well, that's Tanakh's spin on the story. And really, there was a conquest. We have two proofs that there wasn't. Number one, there's no destruction destruction layer in Jerusalem. There is a destruction layer 100 years later from the Babylonians. But from the time of the Assyrians, there's nothing destroyed. The city goes on and lives on. Number two, and perhaps even more uh, of a proof, we have three copies of this prism, Sancheriv's prism. Hey, Sancheriv, like all kings, uh, doesn't use Twitter, but he uses something very similar. He writes up all his conquests and his victories. And I conquered this one and that one and the other one. And Lachish I destroyed and the Shvela I destroyed. Destroyed. But when he comes to Jerusalem, he says, Hezekiah, king of Judah, I shut him up like a bird in a cage. Meaning he doesn't say he conquered the city because he didn't conquer the city. He had a great siege and then he left. Okay. Now, this metaphor of the bird in the cage is fascinating because Isaiah 
may be playing with this metaphor. Does he know about this prism? Well, we found three copies, which gives us a sense that there were, this was a known thing throughout the Assyrian Empire. So it's very possible that Isaiah knew this phrase. And what does he say? He says, you think you shut me up like a bird in a cage? No, like birds that fly, porim afot, even so will the Lord of hosts shield Jerusalem. You shut me up like a bird? No, I'm a free flying bird because God is protecting me. Now, this kind of a triumphant story has two shadows to it. Number one, the people of Jerusalem believe that the temple will never be destroyed. And that's going to have a great effect on their future history because they don't think that God will ever destroy Jerusalem. That's number one. Number two, it seems from recent archeological evidence that the Assyrians do not go home. They go a few miles down the road to a site that today is a beautiful kibbutz called Ramat Rachel. Uh, we have an archaeological site that uh, up until recently was identified as palaces of Judean kings. Today, we think it was the headquarters of the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and then the Persians, right? The foreign headquarters in Jerusalem. They don't stay in the old city, but they stay very close by and control from afar. But meanwhile, Jerusalem has bought itself a hundred years of peace right, and quiet. But what happens in that hundred years uh, is uh, mostly downhill with one very big high. Okay. Um, we have uh, the time period after Chizkiyahu, we have Menashe. Okay, Menashe is this king who wholeheartedly gives himself up to idolatry. And we have 50 years of idolatry. Uh, and it seems very likely that Torah is more or less forgotten, that the prophets are sent underground, that people who are listening to God, who are following God, also have to go underground. And therefore, it's not all that surprising that when um, Menashe's grandson, Josiah, comes uh, comes to be king, and he's very young, he's eight years old when he starts to reign, uh, and a few years into his reign, he is brought a Torah scroll that is found in the temple, a hidden Torah scroll. And they read it and they say, What's going on? What are all these laws? What do we do with this? This is very frightening, right? So what do they do? They go to the prophetess Hulda. Remember we mentioned Hulda, right? And she says, thus says the Lord, I am going to bring disaster upon this place in accordance with the words of the scroll which the king of Judah has read because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods and vex, vex me with their deeds, right? Hulda tells them that they've been on the wrong path. But she says, you, Yoshiao, you, Josiah, because you have, uh, you have done and tshuva, you have done repentance, you will be, you'll be spared, okay? Now, people who, there are many scholars who say this is the beginnings of the book of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy, which we started reading Parshat Shavua yesterday, that it was only written at this time. I would say the fact that Jewish uh, law and Jewish teachings were erased in the course of 50 years is not particularly surprising. Take a look at the recent events in the former Soviet Union to understand that for a, a generation to be without Torah is not so difficult for it to be completely forgotten. And, and I think that it's just lost and forgotten. And Josiah hears this and he goes on a huge religious reform. He purges the idolatry from the temple. He goes to the cities around and he gets rid of the idolatry, one of the most fascinating artifacts that we found from this time period is an entire temple that was discovered in the southern city of Arad, meaning a, an altar, a temple, a holy and a holy of holies. And that's what you're looking at over here with an incense altar that was just put into Geniza. It was buried underground during this religious reform. And he creates a new covenant between the nation and, uh, and God, and everything seems to be on the right track, right? We have this enormous religious reform, except then the great downfall of all great heroes, hubris, right? Uh, Josiah decides that he is going to save the kingdom of Israel, bring it back to the fold. We have this kind of stumbling, the beginnings of the end uh, of the Assyrian empire. Uh, and Josiah thinks that he is going to be the one who is going to take the place of the Assyrians. And so he goes north to fight against the Egyptian Paro, okay? Paro Necho, who also wants to take the place of the Assyrians. Okay? And he goes north and they engage in battle in Megiddo. Now we have a fascinating uh, look at this 
this story in the book of Chronicles, right? We, it's mentioned in the book of Kings, but we hear it again in the book of Chronicles. And here we get this great, what the, what the king of Egypt says. After all this furbishing of the temple by Josiah, King Necho, Paro Necho of Egypt came to fight at Carchemish on the Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. He says, you're not going to be the one who's going to take over from the Assyrians. I'm going to be the one. And Paro Necho sent messengers to him saying, what have I to do with you, king of Judah? I do not march against you this day, but against the kingdom that wars with me. Refrain from interfering from God who is with me that he not destroy you. Paranacho says to Josiah, back off. This is not your battle. Back off. I won't bother you. Leave me alone and I will leave you alone. But Yoshiahu is sure that he can defeat Neho as well as the Assyrians. And they go to battle in Megiddo. Megiddo has been traditionally a place of battle. It's a very important passageway. This is Megiddo over here that you see here. Um, and he didn't heed him. He donned his armor. He came to fight in the plains of Megiddo. Archers shot King Josiah. The king said, get me away from here for I'm badly wounded. He's brought back to Jerusalem. He dies. Jeremiah, who becomes a prophet early on in Josiah's reign, Jeremiah composed laments for Josiah, which all the singers, male and female, recited as is done to this day. Some people think, by the way, that the third chapter of Echa is Jeremiah's lament about Josiah, Aniha Gever. Right? He's talking about himself lamenting over the fall of the last righteous king, the last good king of Judah. And from this point on, uh, everything changes. And we have only puppet kings, and everything begins to fall apart. And this is where we get to the story of our, our most personal and our most tragic prophet, and that's the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Yermiah. And he is prophesying, he, he has a, an almost impossible job because his job is basically to tell the people there's nothing you can do. The die has been cast. And if at the very beginning when Josiah is king, there's a little bit of hope, there's no hope now. Uh, and the die has been cast and you just have to accept the fact that Jerusalem is going to fall. The temple is going to be destroyed. You are going to be sent into exile. You have to accept that and move on. And this is very, very difficult. So a little bit about Jeremiah, because he's so personal, let's understand a little where he's from. Hey, the beginnings of the book, the words of Jeremiah, son of Chilkiah, one of the priests at Anatot. Jeremiah is a Kohen. He comes from one of the cities of the Kohanim, Anatot, which is today the Arab town of Anata you can see here, um, in the territory of Benjamin. Uh, he begins his, uh, his prophecy in the days of King Josiah, and he continues until Jerusalem goes into exile, literally, right? We know in the keynote, Jeremiah is following the people. He doesn't go into exile. He stays with them in the land of Judah and ultimately goes down to Egypt, but he is with them until the very end. Um, now, the fact that he is a Kohen and the fact that he is from Anatot are both very significant. First of all, we hear about Anatot. He has to buy by land from uh, from his cousin in Anatot to show that eventually we're going to come back to the land. But we have another uh, idea uh, presented by Ze'ev Ehrlich from the Beit Sefer Sadeh, from the field school in Ofra, who says that because Jeremiah is from Anatot, Anatot is a fascinating place because Anatot is where the house of Eli is from. Remember Eli from the book of Samuel, right? The house of Eli is, uh, is from Shiloh, right? They were the priests in Shiloh. And that's where they go when they are disgraced. They live in Anatot and their descendants live in Anatot. Uh, and Jeremiah is the only prophet who remembers what happened in Shiloh. Hey, when the people say, oh, God's never gonna destroy the temple. What does Jeremiah says? Go to my place at Shiloh where I established my name formerly and see what I did to it because of the weaknesses of, wickedness of my people Israel. The tabernacle, the Mishkan was destroyed in Shiloh. God says I could destroy my, my, my temple in Jerusalem as well. So Jeremiah is carrying with him that legacy of the, pro, of, the, of the priests of the house of Eli. So where is Anatot? And this is going to be important to us in a moment. Okay? Um, Anatot is Anata, right? If you know contemporary Jerusalem, right? If you go to Northeast Jerusalem, Pisgat Ze'ev, right? And you head out towards, this is the direction to Beit El, to Shiloh, to Shechem, right? But to the east, you have Anata, and you have also not far away, five kilometers away, you have the very powerful spring of Ein Prat, the beginning of Wadi Kelt, and we're going to come back to that. Okay, so Jeremiah does not live in Jerusalem. He lives on the edge of the desert, okay, east of Jerusalem, near a, a mighty spring, but definitely on the edge of the desert. And he's about a two hour walk from 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem being, of course, the old city. So keep that in mind as we go along. Okay? Now, being uh, located next to this very powerful spring uh, is, is important for him because, um, first of all, he, he uses it as a metaphor. Right, water is always a metaphor in Tanakh. Water is a metaphor for reward and punishment. God gives us water when we are good. Oh, did I lose my camera? I seem to have lost my camera. How yes, I was happen? wondering if I should interrupt. Yeah, if you uh, no, want. To okay, is it back? It's it back. There. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Sorry. Okay, so first of all, water is this powerful metaphor in Tanakh, and Jeremiah lives right next to this amazing source of water, right? This is, if you've ever been to Aim Prat, it's this huge rushing sources of water. Uh, and he can't understand. He looks at this water and he looks at the people in the village right above and he says, why have you built these cisterns for this little paltry bit of rainwater when you could just walk a little bit and get to this true source of water? And he, of course, like all good prophets, turns that into a metaphor. He says, for my people have done me a twofold wrong. They have forsaken the fount of living waters, i.e. The, the spring here of Ein Prat, and they have used themselves, borot, borot nishbarim, broken, broken cisterns, which cannot hold water. Hey, Jeremiah, Jeremiah also uses the water of a prop for symbolic actions that he does, which all good prophets do. We, for lack of time, are going to skip that for now. Uh, he also is close to the desert. And the desert is a major theme in Jeremiah, both on a personal level. Everyone's rejecting me. I'm going to go away in the desert to go cry in the desert. Uh, but he also talks about the desert as uh, this beautiful beginning of the peoples of Israel, right? Uh, which we, we read just recently, right? Two weeks ago in the Haftorah. Go proclaim to, the Jeru to Jerusalem, said the Lord. Um, I accounted to you the devotion of your youth. How you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Right, The very beginnings of Israel's history, how we go with God out into the desert, out into the wilderness. So the wilderness is kind of this honeymoon period in Jewish history, but it's also a place where you go because things are so terrible and so desolate and you go to get away from people and you go to weep. It's a refuge, it's a metaphor, and he uses it all over the place. Uh, now, one of the things in uh, more modern Tanakh scholarship uh, is taking a look at the places where the books are written and where the prophets come from. And, and one of the real pioneering scholars in this was someone named Noga Haruveni. Noga Haruveni, uh, his parents were the first botanists uh, in the Hebrew University, and he is the founder, was the founder of Neokadumim, the biblical nature reserve. But the first book that he wrote already in the 50s, uh, he calls it a new light on the book of Jeremiah. And he says, people read the book of Jeremiah and they don't understand. They, they want to amend things. They want to change things. And that's because they cannot understand where Jeremiah came from, right? What is his background. And he brings fascinating examples. I'll just bring a few of them for you. He says, Jeremiah is um, pretty much the only prophet who is always talking about hashkem ve, wake up early. I woke up early or haloch ve, I walked as I was, you know, taught, I walked and thought, right? Why is he waking up early? Why is he walking? Because he lives two hours away from Jerusalem. So he is always has to get up early in order to get to Jerusalem for, you know, prime prophecy hour for the time when everybody's going to be in the market and he's going to be able to speak to them. And he has this long walk where he's thinking through his message and he's formulating it and he's, he's deciding what to say. And one of the most powerful passages in the book of Jeremiah over here, uh, Jeremiah, 20, right? Pititani Hashem ve'epat. Jeremiah is bemoaning his fate. He knows that when he gives his prophecies, they will not bring him fame and fortune, completely the opposite. And he says, I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to say anything. You enticed me, O Lord, and I was enticed. You overpowered me. I have become a constant laughingstock. Everyone jeers at me. Every time I speak, I must cry out. But for the word of the Lord causes me constant disgrace and contempt. I thought I will not mention him, right? He says, I will shut him up. I won't say what God says. And you can picture your meow walking along and this, this conflict raging inside him. No, I'm not going to talk about it this time. I'm not going to say it because it's just going to get me in trouble. But his word was like a raging fire in my heart, shut up in my bones. I could not hold it in. I was helpless. It's, it's the most powerful description, I think, that we have of prophecy. It, it, it's really uh, incredible. 
Um, and, uh, and, and you can picture it on the scene of him walking to Jerusalem. Okay, one last thing that Noga Ruvedi mentions, right? Uh, Jeremiah says, I will deal with you inhabitants of the valley. Okay, um, he says, uh, Yoshevet Yushalayim Yoshevet HaEmek inhabitant of the valley. How is Yushalayim in the valley? Yushalayim is on the mountain. Well, if you're coming from Anatot, you are coming from above. You are passing by Mount Scopus. That's what this nice picture is here. This didn't exist in the time of Jeremiah. Okay? You're passing by Mount Scopus and you are looking down at Jerusalem in the valley. So Nogar Ruveni shows beautifully how, um, how the book of Jeremiah could only have been written in the place where it was written. Um, now, he has many, many um, things to say against the people of his time, and particularly the kings of his time. Eh? The powerful king after King Josiah is Jehoiakim, eh? Josiah's son. Uh, and not only, as we see, is he somebody who is indifferent to the word of God, he is also indifferent to his people. Eh? And we have this very powerful message. Hoi bone beto below tzedek. He who builds his house with unfairness and his upper chambers with injustice, who makes his fellow man work without pay and does not give him his wages who thinks I will build a vast palace with spacious upper chambers, provided with windows paneled in cedar, painted with vermilion. Um, the first excavations in Ramat Rachel were done by uh, Yohanan Aharoni, and he believed that he had found this incredibly ostentatious palace of Yehoiakim, and he found the window balustrades and the pillars. Like I said, this is controversial today, but it's still a very powerful message. Um, the other famous story that we have with Yehoiakim is that his, his uh, scribes bring him, Gumariahu ben Shafan, the scribe, the good scribe, and this is his seal impression over here, brings him the words of Jeremiah, and he has such contempt for it that he just tears off the pieces and throws them in the fire. Just every time that one column is read out, tear it off, throw it in the fire, tear it off, throw it in the fire. And it's this, Not yet. And, and this is this complete contempt for the word of God uh, that, of course, leads us to the destruction and the exile. So we have a two-stage exile. We have what's called the Galuta Harash Vahamazger, the exile of the craftsmen. And this is the exile of the elite. Nebuchadnezzar comes, you have this uh, kind of caretaker king, Yehoiachin, who's put into place. He is taken off to exile okay, with all of the treasures, with all of the, the, the more wealthy people, with all the people of the government, as well as the craftsmen and the smith. Only the poorest people in the land were left. And this is a fascinating thing because what we have now is we have a split screen. We now have a community in Babylonia and we have a community in Jerusalem. For 11 years, these two communities coexist. Now in the pictures, this is an amazing discovery that was made in Jerusalem not so long ago. This is at the back of the Kotel Plaza which has only recently been excavated. Uh, and what they discovered among many other things is a very uh, large, impressive first temple period house, which unlike what you would expect, right? A house that had been destroyed should have lots and lots of stuff in it. It actually doesn't have any stuff. It was almost completely cleaned out. Uh, they found this, this royal seal, which is interesting, but they didn't find much of anything else. And what we think is that this was the house of one of these important people who packed up and went to Babylonia. It was 11 years before the city was destroyed. He had time to pack his stuff. And that's why once the house was destroyed, 11 years later, there's nothing in it anymore. So you have this first exile. Now, while Jeremiah is in Jerusalem, you also have a prophet in Babylonia. And that's the prophet Ezekiel, Yechezkel, who is a fascinating, fascinating prophet, deserves his own uh, Zoom class. Um, but he basically spends the time, this 11 years before the destruction, uh, vilifying the people and their sins, right? Ezekiel is a very trippy prophet. He has all kinds of visions. He has to do all kinds of symbolic acts, lots of weird stuff going on. Okay? Um, but what I think is the most, after the temple is destroyed, he brings words of comfort. But what I think is the most fascinating about him is that he's speaking to the people in Babylonia while there are still people in Jerusalem. So while Jeremiah is telling the people that the, the, the city's, sorry, the city's going to be destroyed. 
Ezekiel is telling the people that you're going to come back one day. Uh, and that's Ezekiel 11. Okay? Uh, achecha, achecha, right? I will save your brothers, your brothers, the men of your kindred, all the house of Israel. The inhabitants of Jerusalem say, keep far from the Lord. The land has been given as a heritage to us. The people who stay behind say, you guys, you're in Babylonia. The story's over. You're not coming back. It's ours now. Thus said the Lord God, I have indeed removed them far among the nations and have scattered them among the countries and have become to them a diminished sanctity, a mikdash ma'at, right? Very important phrase. In the countries where they have gone, yet say the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. This is something unprecedented in ancient times. You are going to return, says Ezekiel. It's not the people who have been left behind who are going to inherit the land, but you are going to return. Now, this seems very hard to believe as more things fall one after the other. We have Lachish here again, uh, had been rebuilt in the days after the Assyrians, but it is again one of the fortresses of Judea, one of the last ones to fall. Uh, and we have um, the testimony of Jeremiah, who says it's one of the last cities. And we also have a letter, a letter that was found in the gates of Lachish that talks about how the fires of Lachish are what the people are looking at, Lachish and Azekah, just like Jeremiah says, because they are the last remaining cities in Judea. Judah. And finally, the destruction comes to Jerusalem. Um, we have uh, this um, amazing discovery also made after the Six Day War something called the Israelite Tower, that's what you're looking at uh, in the picture here on the left, um, which is the scene of a final battle. It's in the north of the city. The Assyrian, the Babylonians enter from the north. It's the scene of a final battle. We have Babylonian and Israelite arrowheads that were found in the ashes at the foot of this wall. And this seems to be the place where the wall was breached, where the Babylonians enter the city. Hey, the picture uh, on the right here is, uh, is the writing of Nebuchadnezzar, of course, the conqueror of Jerusalem, uh, on the gates of Ishtar, on the Ishtar gate in, in Babylon. So they come and they destroy the city of Jerusalem. King Tzedekiahu Zedekiah, the final king of Judah, less an evil king and more a very weak king, abandons his people, uh, uh, escapes from the city, is captured by the Babylonians. He is blinded after he has seen his children are, are killed in front of him, and then he's blinded and he's brought to Babylonia. A terrible end of the story. The Midrash takes a look at this enormous cave underneath the northern part of the city, which was really a quarry from Second Temple times, but calls it Zedekiah's cave and says this was the escape route, uh, route of Zedekiah. It's clearly not the escape route because it leads into the city, um, so it doesn't make any sense. But we do have Rashi writing about how he escapes through a cave that emerges ultimately by Yericho, and there he's caught by the Babylonian soldiers. Deep inside the cave, there is a source of water, kind of a mysterious source of water that today is called Zedekiah's Tears because of the story, because of this terrible, tragic story. Um, we have a final piece of the story, which we're not going to spend time on because we're running out of time and I want to answer questions. But we do have this She'erita Pleita, this remnant that stays behind. They are uh, given a governor by the Babylonians, and that's Gedaliah, Gedaliah ben Achikam one of the few families that are still loyal to God during this terrible time. Uh, he sets up his headquarters in a place called Mitzpah, which is Nebi Samuel of today. That's the picture that you see here. But this also ends in terrible disaster. And this is, of course, why we have Tzom Gedalia, another fast day, when you have uh, assassination by another one of the She'eri Tapleta, another one of the refuge, refugees, Yishmael ben Netanya, kills Gedalia, and there's a final exile where they go down to Egypt. Now, is it a final exile? Does everybody really leave, right? When we were growing up, we learned that that's it, the story of Gedalia, everybody leaves last one out, turns out the lights, and nobody comes back until Shivat Zion. That seems to not be the case. Uh, from archaeological evidence, it seems that quite a lot of people, perhaps even 40% of the people, stay on in Judea. Jerusalem, of course, is destroyed, but they do stay on. And, and that's a fascinating question, what happens when the people come back. But we want to look at two last scenes, okay? one in Babylonia and one with a return to Jerusalem. Um, the Jews who go into exile, right, and the map on the right, I apologize, it's only in Hebrew, that's all I could find, but this is where we think that this green area is where we think that the exiles uh, settled by the rivers, right, Al Naharot Bavel, um, about 
40 years ago, there was an amazing discovery that came on the antiquities market. Nobody really knows where it came from, but that's these strange little pillows on the left here. These are the Al-Yahudu tablets. These are cuneiform tablets that were discovered that are basically the archives of the Jewish community in Babylonia in the first hundred years after the exile. Okay? And there are contracts and business deals and all kinds of mostly very secular things. But what's fascinating about them is most of the people have Jewish names. Okay? No contract is ever written on Shabbat these guys go into exile, they lose their temple, they lose their land, but they retain their identity. Okay? They stay Al Naharot Bavel, they refuse to sing for the Babylonians, but they continue to sing for themselves. They continue to sing a song of Zion, and they continue to retain their identity. And that's why when Cyrus gives them an opportunity uh, in, in 538, 539, to return some of them choose to return. And this is this unprecedented opportunity. Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, offers all of the exilees uh, in, his, uh, in his kingdom to return to their lands and build their temples. And the Jews actually return. And it's because they remember, because they sang Al Naharot Bavel. We sat, we thought of Jerusalem. If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. And that's why they are able to return. Now, I know that we have a lot of questions and we have very little time. So I'm going to try to answer them really quickly. I apologize, Rabbi Kalman, but I'm going to make everybody messed up here. All right. Um, there is a pro There are prophets to the 10 tribes, for sure. Uh, Amos is a prophet um, and uh, Hosea speaks to the 10 tribes. Um, all the sources, by the way, you should have and you can look at them again. I apologize that I did read them quickly. Um, right, there are a lot of suggestions. What was the plague? Very interesting question. Um, it does say Lachish on the reliefs, okay, when they are presented to Sancheiriv. Um, there's tons to see in Lachish today. It's amazing if you really, I should shouldn't be advertising it on Torah and Motion, but I just did for Herzog Yimeyun with Dr. Yael Ziegler. We did something about Lachish. Um, even in a good king's reign, how many Torah scrolls would there be? That's very true. And I think that's part of the story that there wouldn't have been. And that's why you wouldn't necessarily know unless a prophet was able to tell you. Um, the book of Jeremiah, yes, it's called Noga Ruveni, New Light on the Book of Jeremiah, only in Hebrew as far as I know, or Hadash, I'll say for your meow. Um, it is definitely available in libraries, not so sure about Amazon. Um, uh, recordings, recordings, recordings. Israel Museum is what in the Israel Museum? Is what in the Israel Museum, Rabbi Kalman, do you remember? I don't know. All right, but I still gave you Except two minutes. Piece, but okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, the pillows, the pillows are in the Bible Lands Museum. 